We've experienced this already, haven't we? <laughs> I just feel like prayers that we were praying before the gathering have been being answered. And um, the reason we can speak to one another is because the Lord has spoken to us. And each of those things that our brothers and sisters have shared this morning have, have been saturated in the word. But the word of God is living and active and he's speaking into our hearts and we're experiencing him building each other up. I used to think that gathered worship was kind of doing some stuff before the sermon. But I have a sense God has already been doing some stuff in our hearts already this morning and that I might do a little bit of explaining about what he's been doing. Um, but really, what we've been hearing, what we've been singing about is that we are, because of the work of the Lord Jesus, because the Lord Jesus gave his life for us, because he died and rose again, no longer does the curse that came over Adam and Eve sit on us. So right at the beginning, the first human beings, they pushed God out of the picture, just like we do. And God gave them what they asked for, life without him. And when you cut yourself off from the source of life, it leads to death. And Satan loves that because he invited them into, then you will be like gods, deciding for yourself what is right and wrong, what is good and evil. But when we cut ourselves off from the source of life and set ourselves up as our own source of life, well, we've got limited time, haven't we? Time is ticking. And yet God has invited us back into his presence and the purpose of our lives is to be in his presence and, and what we're going to see this morning as we think about this encounter with the living God, we're, we're going to be starting a series and I don't know exactly where it's going and I feel we need to bring in those vision statements that God gave us as we um, planted eight years ago um, and come into this mindset of the foundations and expectations of worship. And what we're doing here this morning when we gather each Sunday is not manufacturing something that isn't real. It's stepping into something that God has promised in his word and saying, Lord, make this real. You've promised it, so make it real. We're not rationalizing ourselves and then sort of stirring ourselves up into a state of euphoria. God has said something very, very special about when his people gather. And we're just seeking to step into those realities. I've got a little outline of where I'm going um, on the sheet. Um, the first thing is, nothing has changed. But in another way, everything's changed. This is the first time I'm standing in front of you for four months. And um, the last time I stood here, I was in all of a panic. And those of you who are here, some of you were here for the first time that Sunday, or a lot of <laughs> a number were there for the first time that Sunday. And I was expecting you know, a little group here, and we were full. And I remember feeling that sense of panic. Should I, should I cancel my sabbatical and minister to these precious folk who've come to us? And God very graciously, even as I was praying, and it wasn't an audible voice, but I just had this real release from God. And he said, see, Alex, I never needed you anyway. <laughs> and, and then I went on sabbatical in a great sense of contentment and wanted to explore two main areas. One was gathered worship, this sense of embodied gathered worship, what it means to be together physically and what God might be doing in that time and space. And then the other area was um, kind of radical entrepreneurial generosity. And in small ways, God is bringing those two things together. But in terms of gathered worship, the journey that I went on, I went to meet with a lecturer from the college I was at who's really thought about these things deeply. And it was just like an affirmation. Yeah, what we've been stepping into anyway is, is there, that nothing's changed. In that journey of kind of affirmation, I've also had this sense that 
everything's changing in that although there's nothing new and God has been grounding us in these foundations, we're going to go deeper and wider. And already that's happening. You know, I'm, I'm preaching to more people at Streatham Central Church on an ordinary Sunday than I ever have. And there's quite a few people away. The, the other sense I had while I was on sabbatical was, and this repeated refrain came as I went and visited probably about 15 churches and this little phrase that I've got in the sheets, the living stones have forgotten who they are. But I visited quite a diversity of churches, very conservative through to um, Pentecostal and uh, diverse or not diverse and so on. And in most of the churches I visited, being massively encouraged and it was really great um, to be among them and I learned a lot, but I did have this repeated sense of the living stones have forgotten who they are, that, that people would come and sit and wait for the event to begin and for the professionals at the front or the people who are on duty that Sunday to do their stuff to them. Whereas actually, as that verse on the front of our sheet says, as you come to him, the living stone, you also, all of you, like living stones, are being built together into a spiritual house so, so that the sense of God's presence comes because God's people have gathered. So we're all part of this and we're being built together and the priests aren't at the front. The priests are all of us. We, we have taken on that role that we see in the temple throughout the Old Testament of ministering to one another in the house of the Lord. And it actually made me and, and Lucy and I have chatted about this, like it kind of made us miss home. Because this is my spiritual house. Not because I'm the pastor of it, no, because you're my family. Uh, this, is, this is home. And, and that, that first Sunday back, when I had nothing to do, I was just sitting in the middle of the congregation, and I just felt this sense of, I'm home. I'm home. It's my family. And so, thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you that you are building one another up. Thank you that you are ministering to one another so beautifully. But the sense in which this went deeper and I thought we can, we can push into this more. Started very early on in, in, in May where lots of different reasons I get getting pointed back to Ezekiel 47. And I've just put the main bit of it, the, the introduction to Ezekiel 47 there at the top of your sheets. Ezekiel 47 verse one. Ezekiel's having this vision. So much is it about the temple, the temple destroyed and God leaving because God's people have turned away from him, but then the temple being re-established. And it says here, the man brought me to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple. And if you, if you keep reading in Ezekiel 47, it's saying this, this water is flowing trickle. It just looks like a trickle coming under, under the door of the temple. But then he goes out and out and he sees the water gets deeper and deeper and the deserts are turned green. And then the Dead Sea goes from salt to fresh and living creatures live again. And that goes right back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 2, where we're told that the garden was like a hill. It's implied because all the rivers flow from the centre of the garden. And they, they water the nations. And Ezekiel gets a vision that when the temple is re-established and gathers, then life-giving water will flow. And so what we do when we gather on the Lord's day, on the day that Jesus rose again from the dead, the day that De Jesus conquered sin and death and hell, is that we gather as the living stones of his reconstituted temple where what was only in shadow form in that Old Testament temple becomes a reality in us, looking forward to the ultimate place where right at the end of the Bible, you've got the river flowing from the tree of life and watering the nations. So what is the most supernatural thing you could possibly do each week? Come and gather with God's people as the living stones of his temple. Got two books here. Uh, 
One is by Andrew Wilson. Some of you would have seen me recommend this. Spirit and Sacrament, an invitation to you charismatic worship. Uh, this man is an excellent Bible teacher, really deep Bible teacher. And um, he has, he's from a more charismatic background. That means an expectation of the Spirit moving in the gathering and um, sharing words and praying for healing and so on. But he's recognised that it's possible to ditch um, the important traditions that God has given the church, the sacraments, the, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, and the liturgy, forms of words that have helped the church throughout the year, and the Psalms and so on. And he's, he's saying we need to recapture that. This guy is called Jonathan Cruz. He comes from a very conservative Presbyterian background where they might sing only the Psalms, unaccompanied, very traditional way, really strict form of worship, everything written down in advance. Both of these guys say the most supernatural thing you can do is gather with God's people to be the living stones of the temple. The, the guy that I met with, um, Gary Williams, is at my college. As I chatted him, I thought he would push back and push back on everything I was saying. And he was like, I totally agree with you, 100%, this is what we need. But if you walked into his church, it would be much more the kind of traditional liturgical. And he would come here and he'd be like, ooh, <laughs> this is a bit uncomfortable. And, oh, can't we just uh, see what's written down in advance? Um, those of you who've been, who went to Gospel Community this week, depending on which Gospel Community you're in, um, either this week or next week, you'll be looking at 1 Peter 2. And um, when I preached on this way, way back, as we started at this church, God gave me this title, which um, I found helpful. Um, it's on your sheets. You are heaven on earth so that you can bring earth to heaven. You are heaven on earth, living stones of the temple, the dwelling place of God, spirit, so that you can bring earth to heaven. And to help us think about that a little bit more, I'm going to show two short videos, I think a, a total of seven minutes. We'll dwell on that, we'll see where we get to, and if we don't have time to go deep into Hebrews 10 and 10, 12, we can bring that to next week. Um, nothing's changed. I'm not teaching anything new. I think I've even shown one of these videos before at church. But let's think about how do we step into the promises of God. Um, I've read a deep theological tome summarizing the theme of the temple through the whole Bible. And those videos just nail it. <laughs> um, I'd love to allow time for the Lord's Supper because I don't want us just to talk about embodied gathered worship, um, but to live it and allow the Lord to minister to us. Um, maybe if you're in your gospel communities this week and you've been looking at 1 Peter already, you could go to these wonderful passages in Hebrews 10. Um, Ashley shared this morning um, in response to my message. I, I, I felt really low and um, all of us in family were saying for one reason or another we didn't want to go to church today. And um, I thought, well, either it's all a load of rubbish and I need to give up or God's promises are real and I don't need to push into this and then there's a massive spiritual battle and so I need prayer and my guess is that there will be other people either this week or in future weeks who will feel exactly the same way of I don't want to go, it's really boring or I've got to serve and it's just too much or I'm going to get it wrong or and thank you so much for your prayers and uh, for those messages. Um, if you're not on the WhatsApp group and you don't know what I'm talking about then uh, let me know and I can give you the link. I just want us to look um, at that 1 Corinthians 14 passage. And, and if, if what I'm saying here is not making sense, or what you saw in the videos is not making sense and raises more questions than answers, then brilliant, brilliant. Here's an opportunity to grow and grab me or someone in your gospel community or someone you know or someone you've met today and, and ask about these things. And, and let's be like those Bereans in the book of Acts that Paul says were the best because they tested everything he said against the scriptures. Let's just have a look at 1 Corinthians 14 and then we'll go into a time of the Lord's Supper. Um, Debbie, is that all right? Great. Um, 
1 Corinthians 14, 23. So Paul's been talking about what builds up the church, what things build up the church. And he's saying that speaking, clear, intelligible speech that is saturated in God's word and in the gospel builds up the church, edifies, literally brick after brick, <laughs> builds up living stones being built together. And so he says, in practical terms, 1 Corinthians 14, 23, so if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, that is in other languages, and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say you're out of your mind? Unless, he said earlier, there's an interpretation. We had a lovely example of tongue speaking in Spanish and an interpretation so that we were edified. If Melissa had spoken in Spanish only and there'd been no interpretation, then she would have been edified and those who speak Spanish would have been edified, but the rest of us would have been like, what on earth is she saying? Verse 24, but if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, that is sharing intelligible speech that builds up the body, don't think predicting the future or crazy stuff, or there may be some amazing things like, you know, Gareth, you're gonna get a new job next week. And, and that may happen. I'm not saying that's a word, but wouldn't it be amazing if it turned out to be? <laughs> um, um, but, but no, just building each other, like we have done this morning. When God's spirit goes to work in someone whose heart is open to him and they come into the temple and they experience his presence as God's people are speaking to one another in intelligible speech, they are, as verse 24 continues, they are convicted of sin, brought under judgment by all. Not because we're all wagging our fingers saying, you dirty, rotten sinner, but because... Like, like Assam described, you know, as he stepped into church and, and, and looked at the Gospel of Mark in that Christianity Explored course, his heart was exposed and he was like, I can't fake this anymore, I'm a sinner. Islam can't save me, I need Jesus. Verse 25, the secrets of their hearts are laid bare so they'll fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Do you pray for that every Sunday? Do you get up in the morning and think, I don't want to go? But maybe someone will come and God's going to do a miracle in their heart. We're gathering in the most supernatural place we could possibly be. It doesn't matter whether we're inside or outside in this building or another building. But as we gather as living stones, we are doing something extraordinarily supernatural. We are in the presence of God where heaven and earth come together. You are heaven on earth so that you can bring earth to heaven. We are in the place where the living waters of the Holy Spirit flow from the threshold of the temple out into the world. And as you go out filled with the Spirit, as Jesus tells you that you need to be again and again and again, can bring the good news into the world, but you can also invite others in. And verse 26, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn. Maybe God lays a song or a hymn on your heart this week. Who's, who's um, leading music or hosting next week? Penny would be able to tell us. Ed, there we are. So if someone came with it, told you a song, you could, you could bring it? Fantastic. Let's do some of that. A hymn, a word of instruction. We've had some of those this morning, the revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. We've had both of those this morning. Everything must be done so the church may be built up, edified, brick after brick. Let's take some time. Um, the kids might come in. That's okay. Wouldn't it be lovely if they saw us worshipping the Lord, sharing the Lord's Supper? If you need to go because you... We're told that church should finish by 12. Then fine, we're family here. We're going to share a meal. But it's, it's a weird little meal. It's the end of a meal. <laughs> After everyone had eaten on that first Lord's Supper as Jesus was with them, he did what every Jewish family still does, which is he took the bread of the affliction which had been broken and wrapped in a linen cloth and buried and he brought it out. <laughs> Those of you who've done a Passover meal will know what I'm talking about. Those who don't, it's another wonderful way to learn. And he took out that bread, that unleavened bread, and he broke it and he gave it to them. The bread of the affliction becomes, in the Jewish Passover meal, the bread of redemption 
and they drink from the cup of redemption. And Jesus says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat this in remembrance of me. So, so if you're feeling like you haven't had a full meal, that's normal, because this is the little bit at the end, okay? But this is where Jesus said, take this little bit of bread and realize that I have died for you. And as you eat it, it's like the bread of the presence in the temple. You are invited into God's presence through the curtain of the Holy of Holies. Look at that passage this week. It's there on your sheets, but I haven't had time to read it. Into the, into the very presence of God. And then drink from the cup of redemption that Jesus handed around, and they all took a little sip. And experience in your mouth, in your taste buds, and then down into your stomach, something physical that says one day your body is going to change. Because Jesus says, I will drink and eat this anew with you in the new creation. It's a little foretaste, a little kind of crumbs from the future table of the Lord that one day you're going to be in a massive feast with him when heaven and earth are together and you'll be with him and you're invited in. And so if you know and are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, then come with confidence. Take the bread. Take the wine, the fruit of the vine. And thank him for dying for you, his body broken for you, his blood shed for you. Why don't the musicians come up? And then don't, don't hold back. Come up quickly, grab a bit. You can take it in your own time. Um, the kids can come back in. We'll sing. If you want to go through, there you can. If you want to stay in here and just reflect on what we've been thinking about. Please do come eat at the table of the Lord. Welcomed into his presence.